with that, we are returning to uh, John Bakes, who ha has been here on stage before. And I think this time he'll not do an interview, but he'll share some of the things that he has learned, which hopefully is extremely relevant for a lot of you. So what he's going to talk about is what is a startup and which are the challenges and how to overcome them. And I think more than that, why I want you to pay special attention is because he has also agreed after that to be available for Q&A. So we open that up for all ticket holders. So please um, pay special attention to his talk and really see this as an opportunity to have somebody who has written for TechCrunch, who has like seen hundreds if not thousands of startups before, and who can give you his perspective. So please see this as a unique opportunity to learn from somebody who has like seen it all. Please welcome John Biggs back on stage. Thank you very much. Hey, yes, hey. All right, hey guys, I'm John Biggs. I'm not really a writer for TechCrunch anymore. Uh, I'm actually a writer for Coindesk, which is about crypto. Um, and I want to do this. I don't know if you're going to like this, but I just want to tell you guys, uh, I also, I'm working with Banner Snack here, and I'm going to give you a piece of advice. Somebody came up to me when I was walking around here, and they asked me if, they, if you have to pay for journalists like, to cover your stuff, and TechCrunch doesn't take any cash, Coindesk doesn't take any cash. Anybody who makes you pay for coverage is lying to you and is awful. So uh, there you go. I just want to explain that before we get started. So this is a weird thing that I want to share with you guys. This is how to be a really, really awful and horrible person when it comes to being an entrepreneur. And maybe it's not going to be helpful, but I, I enjoy it because it's funny. All right. John Biggs, I caused all the Theranos. If you want me to see your startup or look at your stuff, you can email me, john at biggs.cc. I'm Twitter. Uh, I use that all the time. I post pictures of kittens um, primarily. It's one of my primary, you guys are, a, you guys, this is a really loose crowd. Somebody must have really hurt you boys and girls in the past. Really loose. All right, so 2014. Now we all know the Theranos story, yes? It's Elizabeth Holmes. And I am indirectly responsible for the whole Theranos story. Because in 2014, this woman was gonna change the world. She was gonna fix everything. It was gonna be the best thing in the whole universe. Then she was on stage at Disrupt, TechCrunch Disrupt. We let her on stage and she was, she was hurting people on stage and get, taking blood from them, blood samples, and she was testing it in her machine, which is, wasn't actually a machine that worked. It was more of a machine that she bought from somebody else and put in a basement and then pretended worked. But she's making money, she's making, getting investment after investment, all sorts of exciting stuff. Then she won Best Health Startup at TechCrunch. So this is us screwing up consistently over the course of three years. And I personally screwed up consistently in my life, uh, but this is impressive that we could do this as an organizational scale. Uh-oh, uh all of a sudden, 2016, the COO, who was actually dating Elizabeth Holmes, steps down. And we start covering that, too, because that's really exciting, that's juicy. Because previously, it was just like a female founder who was really cool, was doing something, well, kind of weird, actually, was doing something cool with blood, and we didn't understand it because we're journalists. We understand things on a very surface level. So if you tell us that somebody's doing something cool with blood, we're like, yeah, it's been done before. Dracula did it. So why not this woman? So, oh, geez, you guys. Are we excited? Are we, how are we tired? What's wrong? Yes? Okay, good. I flew, I, I woke up, I, I didn't sleep last night, I flew here from New York just to come to see you guys. Oh, oh, oh no, it's getting worse. And this is another company that we supported, U-Beam. See U-Beam right there? That's another company, they were sending electricity across rooms. Which if you know anything about electricity is probably a bad idea. Because if you step in between the beam that you're sending, you can burn your insides, it's very similar to a microwave. But we were like, hey, that seems like a great idea. Let's see if we can pull that off, too. Now, I want to see, oh, here's, and then, oh, now she's going to sue everybody. She's failed in 2019. Now, my question is, where were the journalists? Where was I? What was I doing at that time? And what I was doing was I was riding around on a small motorized cooler uh, 
that's me on a cooler, riding around on it. And that's basically what I did for the entire Theranos era. I remember distinctly people asking me what I thought of Theranos, and I'm like, it seems like a possible idea. I even called a PhD friend of mine, and she said, yeah, absolutely, you can take blood samples, small blood samples, and you can get some data out of them, but not very much, and it's been done before, it's not very impressive, but yeah, maybe she pulled it off. Everybody was fooled by this, but the question is, why was she fooled? Aside from the fact that we were all riding on motorized coolers through, uh, through big halls. That cooler was not designed for a man of my stature, I assure you. Why were we such morons, is the question I need to ask. And this is a question that you need to ask of all journalists, and actually of yourselves. If you're an investor, if you're an entrepreneur, you have to figure out where the grift is, where the trick is uh, that you need to understand. And actually, why are we such morons? Why am I such a, still a moron when it comes to understanding these things? So I'm going to give you an understanding of how journalism works, how we cover topics that we don't understand, how you can also use that to your advantage, and also how we have to fix these things to make things better for each other. So tech is hard because nobody understands it, obviously. And simple things look important if taken out of context. So if you went to a, I don't know, aeronautical engineer and told him, asked him what the coolest thing he's ever seen was, it's going to be something really, really wacky and really complex that you're not going to understand. But if somebody comes to you and says, we made a flying car that runs on water, we're like, yeah, that seems like a good idea. Cause, and you could even ask the aerospace engineer, and he's going to say, yeah, feasible. It's water, and it's a flying car. It's possible. But, and maybe they pulled it off. They didn't pull it off. We all know this. And if you get into that flying car, you'll die. But uh, still, if you, if you granularize something, if you shrink something down to its very, very essence, as simple as possible, and you tweak it just very slightly. Blood testing, but very, very small. Flying car, or a car that runs on water, and then add flying to that. Uh, a, a Fitbit for dogs, all kinds of exciting stuff. You can fake all kinds of things. And also remember, founders under pressure go crazy. This is something to consider. Um, you guys don't have fraternities here, do you? Like a bunch of guys who get together and get drunk and like beat each other up and like, or, or, or jerks. Well, what fraternities do in the States is when there's an alcohol death at the fraternity, they all really clam up. They get really, really silent for a long, long time because they feel really bad about the alcohol death. Actually, their parents are getting lawyers involved and everything on the, in the backside. But as soon as a founder goes under pressure, they become like a fraternity that had an alcohol death where everybody's really, really, really nervous about saying anything at all. Okay. So journalists and, and, and investors don't, don't understand tech. I was just talking to my buddy Ralph, and he would go in, and he would go talk to investors. I hope I'm not stepping on his, uh, his story. He would go talk to investors, and he's, he's a security guy. He's, he's a guy who can hack any one of us in, in about 15 seconds. And he says, okay, you don't believe that you want my product? Well, I can hack you in about two minutes if you give me some pertinent pieces of information. And the investor didn't believe him, A, and the investor didn't want to be hacked because they were afraid of the whole thing, because they didn't understand what he was saying. So Theranos, we didn't understand what she was saying. We, we thought it sounded pretty cool. This is Edward R. Murrow, by the way. He's a journalist. Uh, I only put him there because he's old and white and also dead. And he didn't understand anything about tech. Again, simple things can look important if taken out of context. So what was the key to Theranos? The key to Theranos is that you, you had the possibility of this thing working. Somebody in, somewhere in your head, you said to yourself, this thing can work, maybe it's gonna be better, maybe it's not, and does it really matter if it doesn't? Now the trick is, this is a life or death situation. So if I send in my, I don't know, my vial of blood and I find out that I have herpes, which I do, um, I'm gonna be happy. But if I find out that I don't have herpes, which I don't, um, not really, sorry. Um, I'm also gonna, I'm gonna be really nervous. I'm gonna go to the doctor. I'm not gonna get a false positive, all kinds of other stuff. So this is a life or death kind of situation. Also, here's the founders under pressure going crazy. 
I'm going to give you some examples of founders under pressure going crazy. I only have like nine minutes, so we've got to hurry. This is what they did internally at Theranos. So at Theranos, there was this guy named John Cortlieu who was a writer for the Wall Street Journal. And he was the one who was starting to discover what was going on internally. And he was asking questions, and he was approaching people in San Francisco, and he was trying to figure out what they were doing. And they made a game that was basically shooting this guy in the head with this little robotic, whatever the thing is down there, this little thing here. I don't know. Oh, that's a Theranos machine, actually. It shoots a laser, and you can blow up his head. Now. We had the same kind of thing with us. I think somebody at some point uh, sent an email to us that said, if I had a bullet, a gun with one bullet, and uh, I needed it, I had, was sitting with you, me, Hitler or Stalin, I'd probably shoot you. So we get that kind of thing all the time. But to make an entire video game about it is highly problematic, right? Then you have this guy. This was, uh, this was the founder of Klinkle. Now, Klinkle came out just before Apple Pay, just on the cusp of Apple Pay and all this other good stuff that was going to change the world. But what he had the idea of doing, and this is, again, a very simple idea. I'm going to use my phone, and it's going to vibrate in a very specific pattern, and it's going to connect to the, uh, it's going to connect to the cash register system, and I'm going to be able to pay with my phone. Right now, everybody can pay with their phone. Back then, this guy was lying. He couldn't do what he said he was going to do. And it sounded, it was ridiculous anyway. But they gave him 100, 200, 300 million dollars to do it. And he would show how, put pictures of himself on Instagram with all the cash. He would also burn cash to light his cigars with. He was a full bore asshole. And he went to Stanford and he was some kind of special golden boy to all these jerks in, in, in the valley. Uh, but there you have it. So founders under pressure go crazy. Uh, another example of a founder under pressure going crazy <laughs> is this guy who was actually formerly a businessman who was actually a slumlord. I don't know if you guys have slumlords here in, in the enlightened Europe, but this guy was essentially a slumlord. Um, he didn't pay anybody, and then he was on TV for a minute, and then we elected him president. But as you notice, he's going crazy because he's under a lot of pressure right now. He has no idea what to do, so he's lashing out, very similar to a wolverine or a wild boar. Uh, let's see here. Okay, this is how you can do this. And what I want you to take away from this, since this is a shorter presentation, is that do everything the opposite of this. Okay, how can you scam investors and the press? First, you have to be awful, right? You have to be really, really, really terrible. And you have to be socially awkward and nervous around people, and you have to hire all the best lawyers and security people and weirdos to surround you uh, to ensure that you're going to get the maximum bang for your awfulness buck. Uh, create something that everyone thinks should exist by now, that, uh, that, that everything thinks that should exist by now. Right now, flying cars that run on butter should exist. It's absolutely a necessity in, in our lives. But it doesn't exist. But if you convince somebody that you've kind of made it and you show them a big model of one, and maybe if you're a weird, awful person who has a lot of money and they think you can pull it off, then go for it. Uh, be super secretive and only let certain vetted journalists, aka lapdogs, in on what you're doing. So, and this is, I'm, I'm guilty of this as well. Basically, you have certain journalists that you always go to. So back in the old days, it was David Pogue and Walt Mossberg in the United States. Uh, TechCrunch got a lot of access. Gizmodo got a lot of access. But the access was sort of uh, requir the requirement for the access was to uh, was to be a lapdog. So one of my favorite stories was about Apple. There was this guy uh, Robert Scoble who posted a picture of Steve Jobs when he was sick, and he kind of said, "Okay, this is Steve Jobs. We we love him. He's a great guy. He's sick." Immediately, this guy got cut out from almost everything. Uh, he got cut out from being a journalist, he got cut out from writing about stuff, he got cut out from almost everybody in the valley, interestingly enough, because he, wouldn't, he didn't want to be a lapdog anymore. And he just took a picture of Steve Jobs being sick, but whether that's a mean thing or a bad thing or not, threaten everyone you know with lawsuits is always a good thing to do. Lawsuits are wonderful. You guys don't have a lot of them here uh, in Europe um, because 
you have world wars, but, uh, but we, have, we have them in the States because it's easier. Um, oh, well, now you don't get to see that part. Be very sad you fooled everybody uh, once you're done. Be really upset, and then you want to repeat it as many times as possible. So the grift that you run on the Valley and on journalists and on everybody should be repeated over and over and over again. And because there are second acts in American lives, you can actually pull this off. There are a number of people who are trying very, difficult, very uh, diligently to do this, and I'll show you an example. Uh, who pulled this off? Magic Leap, Segway, Segway was really dumb. Cold Fusion, uh, the actual attachment of atoms or whatever. Uh, Mind to Minds was a startup. Gizmondo was a really fun thing. Gizmondo was a gaming tablet that came out just before the uh, iPhone, and the founders of the gaming tablet uh, used all their investment money to buy Lamborghinis, or actually rent Lamborghinis, and then crash them into cars uh, over and over again. Uh, and ugh, so many. Oh, well, there you go. Enjoy. Uh, also, there's this fucking guy. So this guy is called Boaz Manor. Now, he was a disgraced financier from Canada. He was kicked out of the, he was kicked out of the, whatever their Wall Street is up there. Um, and he came back to America under the name Sean McDonald. Now, homeboy doesn't look Irish by any stretch of the imagination, but he came back as Sean McDonald. And he started a company called Bit Blockchain Terminal. And everybody was convinced this is the greatest thing ever because it's Bloomberg, but it's also a uh, blockchain. So you put them together and you get like ice cream with chocolate in it. It's great. Boaz Manor, he fooled everybody, including uh, me. I was suckered by this guy. This is, his, this is the guy that worked for him because he never really connected himself directly to the operation. But I think the answer, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that you have to simplify your story in a way that people that you want to understand it can understand it. You can't simplify it all the way down and dumb it all the way down because it will become immediately suspect. The bullshit detector goes off at certain levels of absolute garbage. Theranos was a very, very simplistic idea that didn't, pull out, that didn't come through. This was a very simplistic idea that didn't come through. Any number of these was a very simplistic idea that didn't come through. What you guys have to do as storytellers, as entrepreneurs, you have to tell your story as clearly as possible, but you have to leave in all the detail. Because the detail is important, because that proves that you understand what you're talking about to the investors who matter. It proves that your business is going to grow and going to, going to succeed, because you understand all the aspects of it that are important. Uh, and you're not just talking out of your ass. And it also shows that you actually have a business. A flying car that runs on butter sounds like a business, but how are you going to get all the flying cars and where are you going to get all the butter? It's a very, very difficult proposition. Building a SaaS platform for, I don't know, WordPress improvements is an entirely different thing. And if you explain it correctly, and you explain it in a way that makes people excited about it, you can actually win without being an awful person. I guess that's what I'm trying to say here. I have about 32 seconds. I'm John Biggs. Uh, this is me. I'm this fucking guy. And uh, hope you enjoyed it.